our people in the 60s and 70s were just trying to learn how to become Kenyans. Unfortunately, the uh, Kano government led by Mzee Jomo Kenyatta immediately began to cannibalize the independence constitution. A white you know, colonial state was replaced by a black African kleptocracy. And so the values that motivated all of us as Kenyans to fight for independence um, you know, became very tenuous. And the most significant thing that Moi did for a human rights defender like me was release all political prisoners. Little did we know that just a few years later, he was going to have more political prisoners than this country has ever seen, especially from 1982 after the attempted coup. He became totally um, intolerant. <laughs> The state um, became repressive against its own people. And when the state becomes repressive, the first thing it does is to, um, uh, you know, contract political space. The state was defined by arbitrary arrests, detentions, uh, unfair trials, uh, acts of police brutality, including uh, assassinations, rampant corruption in society, uh, the constriction of political space. We registered the organization in 1992 in, in, in Washington, D.C., and we asked Maina to come, to come home. This was the early 90s. The people who, who knew what human rights was, understood the international standards and the international law around human rights, were not very many. So, we, but people were working from the, the basis of, we don't want to be oppressed, which is fine. But now you give them the tools and the understanding of the actual law that helps you to do that. So as NGOs are being formed, and they're not getting registration, would give them cover. Would call them project of Kenya Human Rights Commission. There is not a person with a conscience who could not be moved uh, by what happened. It's, um, I believe, uh, a curse. I was on the hunger strike with them until the last political prisoner was released. So that's significant because it was a first open defiance to President Moy, open defiance. and. It was by old mothers. That particular moment um, and subsequent moments where there were public confrontations with the state really became our birth certificate as an organization and defined us in the mind of the public as an organization that was not afraid to confront authority. The police killings uh, campaign for me was very, was very important. And it was also very creative. We began, we went to the body with the families of those people who were killed. We asked them, can you mind we work together? They say, yes, this is what we want to do. We tell them, since the police have killed your son, why don't you give the body to the police to bury it? So we say, we march. So we march with a coffin. We just go, they open. They open because they've got a coffin. It shocked me. But the police were as scared of death as we were. And so we took it and take it to Vigilant's house. We leave it there and say, police. They would beg us, oh, take it. Say, no, you killed the guy, you deal with the body. So not only were we now doing that in terms of protesting, but we're doing further research. I think it was October 2002 when uh, we endorsed Kibaki. We made that decision as an organization, uh, as a corporate organization, as a citizen, uh, that we thought this was the best thing to do. It was just a moment of tremendous joy and achievement when uh, Kanu was routed in the elections. Kenyans, I think, were recorded or polled as the most optimistic citizens in the world. We may not be able to say that today. And the bureaucracy certainly hadn't changed. Very large areas of government hadn't changed. But there was uh, optimism about what could be achieved in terms of uh, you know, uh, reducing corruption, fighting against corruption. But as time went on, and this was very quickly, that the situation began to deteriorate until you had your Anglo leasing, which was, you know, the Kibaki version of Moi's Goldenberg. So we discovered that, in fact, our job had not been done. Dynamics changed. The, the advocacy was no longer a question of just protesting. So the time had come to expand the work of the Human Rights Commission 
into economic, social, and cultural rights. Flower farms, for example, uh, and the EPZ zones uh, were examples of this, where we expanded to make sure that worker rights were not violated. But we also knew that the KHRC itself um, could not replace the voice of the people. We began to reflect on how to begin to uh, position the commission differently in terms of programming, begin to look for a roadmap that would help us in programming economic, social and cultural rights. We're sort of trying to hear what are your experiences in terms of struggle, in ter terms of things that constrain your right to dignity, your right to a livelihood, your right to um, health, your right to education, and trying to translate what they were demanding into, okay, what is the long-term institutional policy legal change that needed to happen? Those human rights networks have become nuclear for movements, for rights, that is emerging from the bottom. Today, I think when one can legitimately talk of uh, the Hakietu culture that is growing. I think the one struggle that defines us completely as an organization is the struggle for a new constitution. You know, we began talking about um, a new constitution for Kenya as an imperative almost immediately after our formation. The constitution uh, became really the battleground for, for these changes and we said, you know, let's agitate for a new constitution which would add guard multipartism. And in 94, we said, you know, let's draft something for discussion. We had done the 92 elections. They hadn't really brought much change, except a few. Uh, there's a number of young, dynamic people then who were, in, as in, who were MPs. But really, the status quo remained. There was a clamor by people to change the constitution. We need to have to, to amend the constitution before elections. We believe that part of the problem of this country's uh, 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 state repression was that the founding document was itself fatally flawed. Moi was saying, he katiba is a letter ugali kwa chakula kwa, kwa meza yako. He said, yes, if you have a good katiba is a letter ugali kwa chakula kwa, kwa meza yako. So we began now that process. And from, actually from that proposal, then the four C's was, was, was then formed. And it was there the first Kenyan constitution draft, the first draft of a new constitution of Kenya, Kenya to Itakayo, was drafted. So in 1997, it was, we had a convention in Limuru, and, uh, and, and out of that, the executive wing was NCC. So we began now sloganeering, no constitution, no elections, no constitution, no elections. So, I mean, we've been party to the, the push and the struggle for constitutional change, again, since the early 90s. So the idea that we needed fundamental restructuring of our state was nothing new. And, you know, for me to see uh, in August 2010, you know, the promulgation of the new constitution, that was a defining moment. Uh, for the Kenya Human Rights Commission. The British government has been trying to hide behind technical legal defences for three years in order to avoid any legal responsibility. And so today we are very pleased that the judge has rejected their arguments as legally flawed. <laughs> The Commission has taken litigation as part of the com complementary mechanisms of addressing the past and also emerging human rights violations. So we have been able to take a number of cases to court and one of them was uh, the Mamao case. Uh, Kenya Human Rights Commission stayed on course and I'm very happy that they were able to get the, the reparations and uh, the British apologize and there's going to be a a monument. The other case we have taken to court is the Nyao's case and uh, this is because uh, there were many atrocities which were also committed by the Moin government in the 1980s and also part of the 1990s and out of that process we have been able to, to, to see compensation for over 110 uh, victims. So public interest litigation was always an important aspect of our, you know, of, you know, of our work. We do have a new constitution which offers us an immense amount in terms of the whole range of rights protection, um, the whole idea of diversity, the whole idea of integrity and accountability, um, 
I mean, our, our governing framework is strong. I think KHRC um, in 2014 is facing some old challenges that have a new face and it will take time before a new culture takes hold. And so those of us who believe in human rights states and societies have to remain vigilant and have to continue working towards ensuring that we are all free and every single one of us has an opportunity to, li to live freely.